In the public lecture, which I gave on 8 April, I tried as far as it is possible in such a lecture to give a broad outline of human life between death and rebirth. This will be considered in greater depth in the next two lectures, so that it will also shed more and more light on life in the physical world. If we are to go into this more deeply, however, we need the preparation which was given in the first three lectures and will also be given today. Speaking to our friends in one place or another, I have often said that if we want to get to know and understand the worlds of the Spirit in which we live between death and rebirth, we must gradually acquire concepts and ideas which simply cannot be acquired through experiences and insights gained on the physical plane, but which will become increasingly more important to us, particularly also for our life on the physical plane. Let us begin by making clear distinction between experience in the world of the spirit and experience on the physical plane. This must inevitably seem strange and may quite take us aback when we hear it for the first time, making us think that these things are hard to understand. But the more we come to be at home in the science of the spirit, the more we shall find them easier and easier to understand. When we go through the physical plane and let the experiences we gain there live in us, one thing must really strike us if we think about it, and this is that the physical plane offers what we call reality. We might say that the less people are spiritual, the more they base themselves on the reality which is so much in evidence on the physical plane. The situation is different when it comes to acquiring insight and understanding of reality. As children, we have to be trained to develop the abilities which enable us to acquire insight and understanding of the physical plane, and we have to go on working at this. It needs mental effort to acquire insight. The physical world, that is, outer reality, does not freely yield up the wisdom and the laws which lie hidden in it. We have to acquire insight into the wisdom and the laws. Human efforts to gain knowledge actually consist in actively gaining access to the wisdom and the laws which are inherent in everything we learn from passive experience. The situation is entirely different when we enter into the world of the spirit, which we do either by going through the training which will make us spiritual investigators or by going through the gate of death. Please note that the relationship which individuals have to their spiritual environment is not always the same as the one I am going to describe, but it is like this in important moments and with important experiences. In life on the physical plane, too, we do not always toil after knowledge. We take a break from this work as from any other work. The things I am going to describe are not a constant necessity in the world of the spirit, but they are required at times. Surprisingly, human beings do not lack wisdom in the world of the spirit. We may be fools in the physical world and yet have wisdom simply come to us in all its reality when we are in the world of the spirit. Things we have to work hard to acquire, laboring day after day if we want to have them, are ours in the world of the spirit, just as nature is ours all around us in the physical world. They are always there in great abundance. In a way it would be fair to say that the less wisdom we have acquired on the physical plane, the more abundantly will wisdom come to us on the spiritual plane. We do, however, have a definite task to perform with regard to the wisdom of the spiritual plane. During the last few days I have spoken of the fact that on the spiritual plane we have the ideal human being before us, who is the religion of the gods, and that we must work our way toward this. We are unable to do so unless we are able to apply our will, will combined with feeling or feeling combined with will, in such a way that we are always taking something away from that wisdom, reducing it and causing it to darken. 
Here on the physical plane, we have to grow in wisdom. There, we must reduce wisdom. For the less we are able to take away from it, the less we find the powers which enable us to gain the powers we need if we are to come close to the ideal of humanity in our true being. The wisdom we take away we are able to transform inside ourselves, making it into the vital powers which impel us toward the ideal of humanity. We have to gain those vital powers by transforming the abundant wisdom which flows toward us between death and rebirth. For this alone enables us to move toward our new incarnation in the right way. When we return to earth, we must have taken so much of that wisdom and transformed it into vital powers that we are able to penetrate the hereditary substance provided by our parents with enough vital powers to organize it. When you meet an out-and-out materialist after death, someone who would not accept the reality of the spirit at all when on the physical plane, and who all his life would have been saying, quote, The things you are saying about the spirit are utter foolishness, and your wisdom is simply the figment of your imagination. I refuse to accept any of it. As far as I am concerned, only the description of physical nature actually counts. Close quote. You will see so much wisdom flowing toward this individual from all directions that he will be positively overcome. To the extent to which he did not believe in the Spirit, when here on earth, he is surrounded by wisdom over there. His task is to take this wisdom and transform it into vital powers which will enable him to create a physical reality in his next incarnation. The wisdom will not allow itself to be taken, however. It stays as it is, and he cannot make it into reality. The horrendous punishment he faces is that whilst in his last life on the physical plane he based himself only on reality, utterly denying the spirit, he now cannot escape the spirit and is unable to bring it to realization. The danger he faces is that he will not even be able to return to the physical world with powers created by himself. All the time, he will be living in fear of being pushed into the physical world by the Spirit and into an existence which denies everything he considered right in his previous life, and he would be unable to achieve reality by himself. Surprising as this may seem, it is the truth. To be an out-and-out materialist and deny the Spirit before death is the best way to drown in the spirit after death and be unable to find the kind of reality which alone meant something before death. The individual then is smothered or drowned in the spirit. We have to acquire these ideas more and more fully as we study spiritual science. If we do this, they will also take us through physical life in an harmonious way showing us how the two sides of life have to supplement and balance each other. They lay the foundations for the instinct which will help us to create this balance in the way in which we conduct our life. Let me give you another instance of the connection which exists between the physical life and life in the spirit. Let us take a single concrete case and assume we have lied to someone here on the physical plane. Please note, I am referring to a particular instance. If you have lied to someone, this would be a particular point in time. The corresponding event in the world of the spirit will also be at a particular point in time. A time will come when we are in the world of the spirit, through initiation or through death, when the soul is entirely filled with the truth we should have spoken. It then torments us, to the same extent as we deviated from it when we uttered the lie. All you have to do, therefore, is to lie on the physical plane, and a time will come in the world of the spirit when you are tormented by the truth, 
which lives and burns in you so that you cannot bear it. We suffer because we then see. This is the truth. We are not in a condition, however, to gain pleasure from this truth. To be tormented by good things, knowing full well that they should uplift you, this is a peculiar quality of the experiences you have in the world of the Spirit. You only need to have been lazy with regard to something where you should have been hard at work, and a time will come in the world of the Spirit when the eagerness to work which you did not have when it was needed, comes alive in you. There will be a time when we experience an inner necessity and feel we simply must put this eagerness into effect inside us. We give ourselves up to it entirely and know it to be something of immense value, but it torments us and we suffer. Another instance concerns something where we do not have much choice perhaps because it has to do with things that happen more beneath the surface in life. Let us assume we have had an illness in life which has caused pain or the like. At some point in time when we are in the world of the spirit, we will experience the opposite mood or state of mind, feeling ourselves to be in health. This mood of being in health will strengthen us to the same extent to which the illness weakened us before. Now this may not only come as a shock to the intellect, in the way the other examples did, but it may also enter much more deeply into the emotional life and irritate the soul. We know that certain things which are of the spirit must always be grasped at this level. We need to consider the following, however. We have to understand that some kind of shadow lies over the connection between the physical illness and the health which gives us strength in the world of the spirit. The connection is a true one, but somehow we feel in our hearts that we cannot really accept this. This has to be admitted. Yet if we really understand the connection, it also has another effect, which may be described as follows. Suppose someone made a serious effort to absorb the science of the spirit and study it and does so not just in theory, by merely taking in thoughts and ideas, in the way other sciences are studied. The science of the spirit should become something like a spiritual life-blood in us, awakening inner responses and feelings with all the concepts it gives us. For those who have the right ear for this science of the Spirit, there is nothing in it which does not either uplift us or allow us to look into the abysses of existence in order that we may find our bearings in them too. We may say that those who truly understand the science of the Spirit will also always follow everything it has to say with their feelings. If we absorb this science, acquiring the habit of thought, and forming ideas, as I have indicated, we actually transform our souls whilst still in the physical world. I have said on a number of occasions that serious study of anthroposophy is one of the best and most effective exercises. A strange thing happens when people gradually enter more and more into the science of the Spirit. If they are doing the exercises, or perhaps do not even do the exercises which will make them into spiritual investigators, but make serious efforts to gain real understanding of the science. It may be a very long time before they have any prospect of having clairvoyant vision. They will have it one day, but it may well be a far-off ideal. Yet if you let the science of the Spirit influence your soul in the sense I have indicated, you will find that the instincts of life, the more unconscious mainsprings of life, change in the soul. You do not become active in the science of the spirit without it having an influence on the life of instincts, so that it will have different sympathies and antipathies, be filled with light and feel more secure than it did before. This may be noticed in every sphere of life, If you are clumsy with your hands, for instance, and become an anthroposophist, you will find that without having done anything but received the science of the Spirit, 
you become more skillful, even in the way you use your hands. Do not say, quote, I know some anthroposophists who are very clumsy. They are far from skillful, close quote. Consider instead how far these individuals have not yet truly made the science of the spirit part of their inner lives, to the extent their karma requires. You may be a painter and have mastered the art of painting up to a point. When you become an anthroposophist, you will find that the influences of which I am speaking flow into the way you instinctively master the art. You find it easier to mix your colors, and the ideas you want come more readily. Or, let us assume you are an academic person and supposed to do some scientific work. Many who are in this situation will know how much effort it often takes to collect the literature needed to solve some particular problem. When you become an anthroposophist, you will no longer go to libraries and, first of all, borrow fifty volumes that are of no use which is what you did before. Instead, you will immediately lay your hands on the book you want. Spiritual science has a direct influence on your life. It changes your instincts and gives new mainsprings to life that make you more skillful in life. What I am now going to say must, of course, always be seen in connection with human karma, for human beings are always subject to karma. However, even if we take this into account, the following is nevertheless true. Let us suppose someone who has entered into the science of the spirit in the way I have described contracts a particular disease, and it lies in his karma that he can be cured. It may, of course, be his karma that the disease is incurable. Yet if we are faced with an illness... Karma never says in a fatalistic way that it has to take a particular course. The disease can be cured or it cannot be cured. Someone who has stepped himself, excuse me, someone who has steeped himself in anthroposophy acquires an inner instinct which helps him to meet the disease and its accompanying weaknesses with something that will strengthen him and be right for the situation. What will otherwise be experienced as the consequences of the disease in the world of the spirit will work back into the soul as an instinct whilst you are still in the physical body. You will either prevent the disease or inwardly find your way to the powers that heal. Clairvoyant consciousness finds the right healing factors for an illness in the following way. The clairvoyant individual is able to have an image of the disease before him. Suppose, then, he has the image before him. Here is the disease. It weakens the human being in this particular way. Having clairvoyant consciousness, the individual concerned perceives the counter-image, the mood of overcoming illness and the growing strength welling up from that mood. He sees the compensation which will come to the individual who had the illness in the physical world when he is in the world of the spirit. The clairvoyant is able to give advice based on this. You do not even have to be fully clairvoyant, for the advice to be given may come instinctively from observing the signs of the disease. The process which brings to clairvoyant consciousness the compensation which will indeed come in the world of the spirit, belongs to the signs and symptoms of the disease just as much as the upward swing of the pendulum on one side belongs to its upward swing on the other side. This example clearly shows the connection between the physical plane and the world of the spirit and shows how fruitful knowledge of that world can be for the conduct of life on the physical plane. Let us go back to the first concrete example I have given today, which showed that just as the physical world is around us on the physical plane, so the spirit, full of wisdom, is around us in the world of the spirit, an ever-present spiritual element. Now, if we take this from a particular aspect, it can throw a very important light on what happens in the world of the spirit. In the physical world we may come across things where we ask ourselves, what is the essential nature of this? 
How does it act and react? What laws govern this object or process? Or we may walk past them as dullards, asking no questions at all. We shall never learn anything of value unless we let objects arouse questions in us and set riddles for us. Merely looking at them will never take us to the point where the soul becomes its own guide. This is different on the spiritual plane. On the physical plane we put our questions to objects and processes and have to make the effort to investigate them and formulate the answer out of the things themselves. On the spiritual plane things and realities are around us in the spirit. It is they who put questions to us, not we who put questions to them. They are there. We confront them and are continually questioned by them. It should be possible for us to draw on the infinite ocean of wisdom for everything we need to answer the questions which are put to us. We have to extract the answers not out of the things themselves, but out of ourselves, for they put the questions to us. All around us are things that put questions. Something else has to be taken into account. Let us suppose we are confronting some process or reality in the world of the Spirit. This always puts a question to us. We find, however, that we cannot develop the will, will combined with feeling or feeling combined with will, to enable us to answer the question out of the infinite wisdom, though we know the answers to be in us. Our inner being is infinitely deep. All the answers are there inside us, but we are unable to give the answer. The consequence will be that we rush past in the stream of time and miss the right moment for giving the answer. We have not gained the ability and maturity, perhaps because of our previous development, to answer the question at this point in time. We have been slow to develop in this respect and would only be able to answer later on. The opportunity will not come again, however. We have missed it. We have failed to use all our opportunities, and so we pass by things and events without giving answers to them. We have such experiences all the time in the world of the Spirit. Thus it happens that in the life between death and rebirth, we face an entity which puts a question to us. Our lives on earth and the lives in the spirit which came between them have not taken us to the point where we can answer the question when it is put to us. We have to go past and enter into another incarnation. The consequence is that in our next incarnation we have to depend on the good gods to give us, without our being conscious of it, the impulses we need so that we shall not pass by when the same question is put to it, is put again. This is the way in which things are connected. I have said on a number of occasions that the further we go back in human evolution, the more we are aware that people did not have the mentality we have today, but a kind of clairvoyance on the physical plane. Our present way of seeing things has evolved out of a dull, dreamlike clairvoyance. If we find people who are still at the primitive, elementary stages of inner development, we find their thinking and feeling still to be more akin to the original clairvoyance. Genuine clairvoyance, I mean primitive, atavistic clairvoyance, is becoming rarer all the time, but in some forms of rural life we still find people who have preserved something from earlier times, so that echoes of the days of earlier clairvoyance still persist. In a dull, dreamlike form, this clairvoyance, in which people see into the worlds of the spirit, has particular features which we also know with developed clairvoyance. This, however, does not show things in a dull, dreamlike way, but clearly and distinctly. Spiritual science shows us that human beings, as they are in the present cycle of time, must more and more be able to give answers at the right time when questions are put to them in the life between death and rebirth. 
their ability to develop in the right way and come closer to the God's ideal of the perfect human being will depend on this. As I have said, this was experienced in the form of dreams in earlier times, and a vestige of this remains in the themes of numerous fairy tales and legends, though this is getting less and less. The legends and fairy tale themes are more or less the following. Such and such a person meets a spirit who keeps putting questions to him which he must answer. He knows that he must answer by the time the clock strikes a certain hour. This is a very common theme. It was the same in the dreamlike clairvoyance of earlier times, and now presents itself again in the way I have described in the world of the spirit. Characteristic features of that world are always a wonderful guide to the understanding of myths, legends, fairy tales, and the like, and help us to place them where they belong. This is a point where we can see how evolution has brought us close to the gates of spiritual science, and this is true even for the intellectual life of today. It is interesting to note that a book which in many respects is well-intentioned like the one written by my late friend Ludwig Leistner, is unsatisfactory because it fails to deal with the themes relating to the questions which are put in the light of knowledge gained through spiritual science. The author would have needed to know something of how spiritual scientific truths come into the subject. Considering the particular instances I have given, we see that something quite specific is demanded in the world of the spirit. It is not a matter of gathering knowledge, as is done on the physical plane, but, in fact, of reducing knowledge and of transforming power of insight into power of life. You cannot be an investigator in the other world in the same sense as in this world. That would be very much out of place there. For when you are there, you can know everything. It is there all around you. What matters is that we develop the will and the feeling toward knowledge and insight, which enables us to produce from the whole treasury of our will activity exactly what is needed at a given time to be able to apply the wisdom. Otherwise we are smothered or drowned in wisdom. In this world it is essential to think, in the other world it is essential to develop the will combined with feeling which shapes and forms reality out of wisdom and lets it become a kind of creative power. There we have the spirit just as here we have physical nature and our task is to guide the spirit to physical nature. A beautiful saying is to be found in the theosophical literature of the first half of the 19th century. It comes from Ettinger, who lived at Moorhart in Württemberg and who was so far advanced in his spiritual development that he was at times able in full consciousness to help spiritual entities, that is to say, souls who were not on the physical plane. His words are remarkable and both beautiful and true. Quote, Spiritual creative power fulfills itself in nature and in nature's forms. They bring to expression the things for which I have been drawing on the world of the spirit itself. In that world, creative power seeks to bring everything to realization that seethes and surges in wisdom. Here we draw wisdom from reality. In the world of the spirit, we do the opposite. The task is to give effect in living realities to what lies in the wisdom. The goal of the gods is reality cast into shape and form. So we see that it is a matter of feeling suffused with will, or will suffused with feeling, being transformed into creative power. This we have to use in the spiritual world in the same way as here on earth we must make efforts to use our thinking to investigate the physical world and acquire wisdom. In view of this possibility in the spiritual world, it is essential that we should develop our feeling and thinking in the right way and prepare ourselves here on the physical plane 
in a way appropriate for the present cycle of time. Everything which happens between death and rebirth in the world of the spirit is the consequence of what happens between birth and death in the physical world. True, conditions are so different in the world of the spirit that we must acquire entirely new ideas and concepts if we are to understand that world. Nevertheless, the two worlds are connected, just as cause and effect are connected. We shall only understand the connections between the spiritual and the physical if we recognize that they have a cause and effect relationship. The preparations must be made in the physical world. Let us therefore consider the question, how can we prepare ourselves in the right way on the physical plane in the present cycle of time so that, whether we enter the world of the spirit through initiation or through the gate of death, we shall have enough inner power to extract from the wisdom to be found in the world of the spirit what we need to forge realities out of the flowing, surging wisdom. Where can this power be found? It is always important to answer such questions in a way that is right for the particular age. It was different in the times when the way of thinking was such that the earliest and most original sources of the themes found in fairy tales and legends became accessible. The question is, where do we find the necessary inner power in the present cycle of time? To help us find the answer, let me mention the following. We may consider a number of different philosophies and try to discover how philosophers arrive at their idea of God. These would, of course, have to be philosophers who have sufficient depth to let the world convince them that it is possible to speak of a divine principle at work in the world. A nineteenth-century philosopher to be considered is Lotze. He tried to create a philosophy of religion which would be in harmony with the rest of his philosophy. Others, too, had sufficient depth to have what we may call a philosophy of religion. All these philosophers had one particular characteristic. True, with reflections derived from the physical plane, their thinking took them as far as the divine principle. They reflected, did philosophical research, and found, as in the case of Lotze, that the phenomena and entities of the world were maintained by a divine ground which was active in everything and brought it to some degree of harmony. The characteristic feature of these philosophies is that when we take a closer look at this divine ground, the philosopher's God, we find it to be more or less the God who in Hebrew and especially also in Christian religion is called God the Father. Philosophers are able to get as far as this. They can study the physical world and have sufficient depth not to deny the divine principle altogether in the empty-headed way of materialists, and this will take them as far as God the Father. If we study these philosophers, we can show quite clearly that philo philosophical thinking cannot go beyond this God the Father, who is seen as the one and only God. Some philosophers... Hegel, for instance, also speak of the Christ, but it is possible to show that this derived not from philosophy, but from positive religion. They knew the Christ from positive religion and were therefore able to include him in the discussion. The difference is that whilst God the Father can be found through philosophy, it is quite impossible to find the Christ through philosophical thinking. This is something I would advise you to ponder and give much thought. Rightly understood, it takes us into momentous depths of the inquiring mind and questing soul. It is connected with something which is brought to expression in the Christian religion in a beautiful symbolic image. The relationship of this other God, the Christ, to God the Father, is seen as the relationship of the Son to the Father. This signifies much, even if it is merely a symbol. It is interesting that Lotze, for example, could make nothing of it. He wrote that this simple excuse me, that this symbol cannot be taken literally, of course. 
for it is not possible for one God to be the son of another. But there is something very telling in this symbol. The relationship between father and son is similar to the relationship between cause and effect. For in a way, we may find in the father the cause of the son. The son would not be there if the father were not there. One thing has to be taken into account, however. Someone who is potentially able to father a son may equally well not have a son, but remain sonless. B would still be the same person. A would be the cause and B the son, the effect. The effect need not necessarily come about, however. The effect results from the cause as a free act. If we study a cause, therefore, and consider it in connection with its effect, we should not merely inquire into the nature of the cause, for that will achieve nothing. Instead, we must ask whether the cause is in fact acting as a cause. This is the essential point. It is characteristic of all philosophy that a line of thought is followed. One thought is developed from another, And if one has a first principle, one is immediately looking for what follows from it. This is all right for philosophy as such. But it will never lead us to discover the situation which arises if one considers that the cause need not necessarily act as a cause. The essential nature of a cause may be the same, whether it acts as a cause or not. This is the significant truth presented in the symbol of God the Father and God the Son. The Christ is added to the Father as a free creation, which is not an inevitable consequence, but a free act presenting itself side by side with the earlier creation. It was also possible for it not to be, and it was not given to the world because the Father had to give a Son to the world, but as a free act, through grace out of freedom, out of love, presenting itself freely as it is created. The kind of truth which allows us to find God the Father in the way philosophers do will never lead us to God the Son, to the Christ. To come to the Christ, we have to add the truth of faith to the philosophical truth. Or, because the age of faith is steadily fading, the truth which is reached through clairvoyant investigation This must first develop in the human soul as a free act. Thus it has to be said that proof of the existence of God is found if we consider the way in which events happen in the physical world. But the existence of the Christ can never be proved externally by considering the chain of causes and effects. The Christ has been present and human souls may fail to perceive him if they do not find the strength in themselves to feel and say, yes, that is the Christ. It is necessary that we actively muster the strength for the impulse of truth which makes us recognize the Christ in the one who is here on earth as the Christ. The other truths, which belong to the realm of God the Father, may be compulsive. We merely have to make the effort to think and be consistent in our thinking. To be a materialist is to lack logic in your thinking. A philosophy of religion, Lotz's or indeed any other, develops when our thinking compels us to arrive at the divine principle. But we can never be made to recognize the Christ by mere philosophy. It has to be a free act and there are only two possibilities. Either we take faith to its ultimate conclusion or we begin to investigate the world of the spirit. We take faith to its ultimate conclusion when we say with the Russian philosopher Soloviev that with all the philosophical truths human beings gain about the world by allowing themselves to be convinced by logic, they do not relate to a truth that is free. It is a higher truth which does not compel us but is a free act. The highest truth which comes through faith Soloviev sees the greatest dignity in this. The higher truth which recognizes the Christ is the truth which works as a free act and not by compulsion. The knowledge which comes for spiritual investigators 
and for those who understand the science of the spirit, is an active knowledge which progresses from thinking to imagination, inspiration, and intuition. It becomes inwardly creative, and in its creative activity comes to be at home in the worlds of the spirit. It is very much what we must develop, whether we enter the world of the spirit through initiation or through death. The wisdom which forces itself on us, on earth, is to be found in the world of the spirit in an abundance that matches the abundance of natural phenomena here on the physical plane. What matters in the world of the spirit is that we have the impulse and the power to make something of that wisdom and create reality out of it. To be freely creative out of wisdom and active in the spirit, this is the impulse which must live in us. We can have this impulse only if we find the right relationship to Christ. The reality of Christ cannot be proved by the external brain-bound logic of the intellect. He brings himself to realization in us when we acquire spiritual knowledge. Just as spiritual science joins the other science as a free act, so knowledge of the Christ comes when we approach the world into which we enter through spiritual science or by going through the gate of death. When in the present cycle of time we want to enter into the world of the Spirit in a fruitful way, that is to say, if we are prepared to die to the physical world, we need the relationship to the world which can be gained by having the right relationship to the Christ. A God such as the God, the Father of Christianity, can be found by considering the physical world while we are in a physical body. To understand the Christ truly, not the way he has come down through tradition, but purely from insight, this is possible only through the science of the Spirit. This takes us into the regions which human beings enter when they die, in a symbolic death when they leave the physical body and know themselves as souls out of the body, or by going through the gate of death. We gain the impulses which we will need when we go through the gate of death by finding the right relationship to the Christ. When in the present cycle of time the moment comes to leave the physical body, either by entering into the development which comes with the science of the spirit or by actually going through the gate of death, we must be able to face the spiritual entity who has come into the world so that we may find the right relationship to this entity. We can find God the Father in the midst of life. We find the Christ when we come, excuse me, when we find the right way to enter into the Spirit, that is, to die. In Christ we die. In Christo morum.